Kevin O'Sullivan, welcome to Virgin Radio and Virgin Radio 80s Plus. This is weird because obviously we're mates and we uh, we're, we're usually in a pub chatting about stuff like this. Yeah, this over is, lots of drinks. <laughs> over lots of drinks. This feels very formal. It's great to have you on. I think the first thing I said to you a few years ago when I met you was, oh my God, I used to see your face on the front page of, I think it was the Mirror, the mirror. in the 90s. Yes. And of course you've worked at the... You've done it all, haven't you? Uh, journalistic. I've been all over Fleet Street. Yeah, um, I work for the Mirror. Um, I work for the Sun. I work for a paper called Today. I work for the Sunday People. You name it, I worked for the papers. Uh, and of course, uh, for all of the 90s, we're not talking about the 90s now, but um, uh, for the 90s, I was in uh, Los Angeles uh, reporting for all the papers, uh, interviewing movie stars, uh, also, of course, writing for magazines and uh, everything. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, after a, uh, a, a an obscenely long career, uh, I, you know, I've been, I've done it all. If you yeah. could say, and you do have the best stories. Like I could throw any celebrity at you, and you will know something that I've never heard of before. And you repeatedly prove this over the years. So I'm looking forward to uh, spending some time with you this week. Uh, was it hard coming up with your list of songs, your '80s playlist? Uh, it, it was. It was. It was hard in so far as you know, I could have come up with a hundred more. So the difficult uh, process was to omit. Uh, the inclusion of these songs and all of these songs they're not necessarily mo- some of them are some of my all-time faves yeah uh, but uh, s- others are not necessarily my favorite songs of all time they are just representative of the era they're the big evocative songs that make you think of the 80s yeah Okay, so we're going to start with the Pet Shop Boys. Which one are you going to go with? Uh, again, with the Pet Shop Boys. I uh, love the Pet Shop Boys. Could have uh, chosen a number of um, great songs, but I went for It's a Sin. Ooh, why is that? Uh, because it's probably my favourite Pet Shop Boy track and also the production. That's the thing about the Pet Shop Boys. Great lyrics, really distinctive voice as well. Uh, but the production... You know, uh, it's just amazing, you know, the way those songs are produced. Yeah. So uh, it's tunes, great lyrics, what's not to like. Did you did you know Neil Tennant? Because obviously he was the editor of Smash It's magazine, I read somewhere, for a good chunk of the 80s before, uh, you know, before the Pet Shop Boys hit the big time. As a, as a fellow journo, did you ever cross paths? Uh, I've met him, uh, but, uh, you know, and I certainly wouldn't say that I know him, but, uh, you, know, uh, you know, if you could list the number of celebrities I've shown shook hands with over the years, <laughs> uh, then I would be the best connected journalist in all of history. However, you know, shaking hands and saying, hi, nice to meet you, doesn't mean that you're a close friend. Uh, so that's pretty much my relationship with Neil Tennant. But I do remember, I think he was on the NME as well, uh, I do remember uh, noting, I'm thinking, oh, a journalist trying to be a pop singer, good luck with that. But he turned out to be an exceptional uh, pop singer, pop star, uh, incredibly creative and still we've never had anything before or after like the Pet Shop Boys Brilliant Kevin O'Sullivan's with me on My 80s Playlist uh, by the way congratulations on the new television show every afternoon isn't it on Talk, Talk TV, TV 3pm until 5pm 5 days a week, weekdays don't miss a second, it's brilliant <laughs> No, you, thank you very much. <laughs> you've done. I mean, you could do it all because you've done the magazine show on a Saturday morning, more heavyweight shows, comment-based shows and stuff. It looks like you're having a, a great time doing it. It Was TV something you always wanted to do? Well, I wouldn't say that. I mean, I've reported on television a lot, uh, as reported on the movie scene in Hollywood as well, of course. Uh, did I want to go into television? I suppose the money always uh, attracted me. You make good money in television. Uh, but I was, I'm was i a newspaper man. You know, uh, my first love, if you like, is news. You know, so apart from doing a lot of showbiz stuff, uh, which I've always enjoyed, uh, you know, covering the Oscars and things like that, interviewing big stars, uh, I've always enjoyed news as well. So... Uh, You know, my news reporting goes back to the Brixton riots in 81. Uh, Also, I, uh, of course, reported on the Rodney King riots in Los Angeles, which was an extraordinary experience. Uh, So the reason that, if you like, I switched into radio and television was you could see that was the way the media was.
was going. I mean, newspapers, uh, you know, they're a different entity these days. Uh, they struggle in a modern world. Uh, they do seem like a relic of the past. Not to say that they don't still do a great job and not to say that they're still not an important part of everybody's life uh, or not everybody's but a lot of people's life and they're a really important part of my life I mean you, because I always go on a Saturday and Sunday I buy all the papers you know and you can see you go into the news agents you know I buy every single one and they go oh you got a lot of reading to do today <laughs> but for me it's second nature and well, you told me what you said you know in order to do what you do you need to read it from cover to cover and be across everything that's, that you're reading yeah and I find that the the good old fashioned print version is the best way to go through the news forensically Mm -hmm. uh, you miss things when you're online that you don't miss when you read the physical paper and I suppose it's also because you know I remember I worked in the golden age of newspapers and it really was the golden age wasn't yeah, it the yeah, 80s yeah. was I was on that excellent paper The Sun uh, back in the 80s when we were selling more than 4 million copies a day 4 and a quarter million copies a day wow. I think one day we peaked at 4-4 four, four or something uh, and I'm afraid the papers can't do that anymore because they're challenged by so many new media. Mm -hmm. When I was a, a junior reporter, a training reporter, I used to pick up uh, the mirror every day, and every single day your face would be on, you know, on the on the front page there. I think you were the TV critic there. I was. I was. I was. I, I was uh, well, I was variously. This is when I came back from LA, uh, right about. Uh, the turn of the century, uh, having spent most of the 90s in Hollywood, uh, and my friend Piers Morgan. I just thought, I just thought, uh, a decade's enough. Uh, I need to get back. Otherwise, I may have gone native and stayed in America forever. I love America. I love Los Angeles. Uh, but uh, I had reservations about spending my entire life there. And yeah. I thought to myself, after a year, uh, after 10 years, as it were, uh, either I get back to Britain or I never will so I phoned Piers up and said uh, got a job for me he said well, you'll find you something and I went to see him uh, so I went to, sh to the showbiz department there became showbiz editor uh, later on features editor and uh, you know then went back to what I would call my first love writing uh, and uh, so Tina Weaver is the editor of the Sunday Mirror uh, said why don't you come and be my TV you're not so much a TV critic on, on those kind of papers you're a TV columnist you have a page like any other columnist mm -hmm. and uh, I did that uh, until uh, I did that for about 12 13 years and uh, it was a great job I mean I just watched television yeah and then I basically took the mickey out of everybody but everybody knew your face everyone yeah. knew your opinions and it was a daily thing to to read well, up was, what you was, had to say well, it was it was daily it started uh, with big brother when piers morgan decided he'd have enough of big brother he said i'm so bored with big brother it's all over the front page of every paper every day i'm sick of it he said uh, let's uh, pour a bucket over it so you can become my big brother correspondent so actually i was called the anti big brother correspondent <laughs> and i wrote a daily column uh, absolutely hurling every insult I could at uh, the programme and everybody in it. It was great fun. Tina Weaver spotted that and said, why don't you come and do that on a general basis for me? Mm -hmm. uh, and I did for the next 12 years. So uh, as I always said about being a t TV critic, there aren't many jobs you can do in your underpants, uh, <laughs> which is what <laughs> I often did sitting around in the summer, you know, with a pair of shorts and nothing else on, just watching all this TV. Uh, a lot of the TV, uh, you know, don't get the impression I actually liked watching yeah. The X Factor or uh, uh, Britain's Got Talent. Uh, they, these kind of shows or EastEnders, they're not really for me, um, but uh, professionally, those were the programmes I feasted on. Let me take you back to the Human League then, Don't You Want Me? It's your next song on the list. What was... Kevin O'Sullivan doing in like 83, yeah, 84. You, you, I'll tell you what I was doing. I was living in an eight quid a week uh, room in Streatham in South London. Uh, I was working for um, the uh, Sutton Herald local paper, but I was doing shifts on Fleet Street. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the reason I've chosen this, as I said, some of these songs, they might not be my personal favourites. I like Don't You Want Me, Don't Get Me Wrong. But boy, oh boy, that was one of those songs that pervaded an entire 
period of time. So you have these songs mm. uh, that you might not necessarily like, but they are completely evocative of the summer of 280. Like a time capsule. Yeah, yeah, they're a time capsule. It brings it all back to you. When you listen to this, you think of the 80s. So that's why I've chosen it. And this isn't to say I don't think it's a good song. It's a, it's a great song. Only great songs achieve this uh, this uh, feat of pervading a period of time and there's no doubt that Don't You Want Me was the obsession of that year. Kevin O'Sullivan's with me all of this week. He having fun, by the way. It's great I to have you here. Fun, so Welcome. I've never had a better time in my life, so, <laughs> as is always the case when I'm with you. Thank you. I mean, it, we just need a few pints and a couple of shots, and that yeah. will be our, our well, usual Straight kind after of... we've done this, we know where we're going. <laughs> Kevin, I've got, I've got a couple of... Uh, I know I've asked you these before, but I'm going to do it again. I always bother you with my insane questions, but uh, as I say... <laughs> sorry, right, sorry Steve, I'm used to them. <laughs> Most famous person you've ever met? Oh, uh, well, there's a number of people. The Queen? Yes, you did. Yeah. Tell me the story about the... Yeah, well, I'm, I'm famous for boring people with this story, <laughs> but it is quite a good story, uh, I big-headedly declare. Um uh, when I was a showbiz reporter on The Sun uh, back in the 80s, uh, I used to have one of my chores. It was Her Majesty's chore as well, let me tell you. Uh, we all had to go to the Royal Variety Show. And in those days, uh, it would start, at, you know, the usual time, 7.30 or something, uh, usually at one of the big theatres, Theatre Royal Jewelry Lane, something like that. Uh, and... It would regularly run on until one in the morning yeah. because they subsequently uh, they put time limits on the performers. Uh, but in the past, they tell we'll edit that later. So you know you would go there and Ken Dodd would come on <laughs> and he would do forty minutes. Gosh. And there were there were like twenty other performers to come it's on. Poor Queen's there for hours. Yeah, you, you know you know what showbiz people are like. Uh, you know they're not noted for their lack of ego. <laughs> so they would go on and on and on. You know and, and so you'd be. Sitting in there it'd be like midnight and then half past 12 and then getting on for one o'clock uh so they used to alternate in those days it was the queen and the queen mother and when the poor old queen mother was there i used to think <laughs> poor old girl you know go she needs to get some sleep end <laughs> this show bring the curtain down uh her majesty this was her majesty's year and it was the year uh when the entire world but particularly britain and america were obsessed with who shot jr in dallas uh, we didn't know who it was yeah. at the time and uh, as a result of that the dallas cast were in invited to do a little turn at the Royal Variety Show. So Larry Hagman, who played JR, and Susan Gray, uh, who played uh, um, Sue Ellen, mm. Patrick Duffy. What a show that Patrick was. It was Duffy. huge, oh, It was a great it? show. Patrick Duffy. Um, uh, they, Bob, of course, Bobby. They all came and uh, they they did their little skit. So anyway, this show uh, traditionally has always run very, very late. And at the end of the show, what would happen is the curtain would come down and then all the performers would form a kind of U, a sort of U, uh, so shaped. And then then the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh would come and talk to all of the performers. Very, very good. Have you come far? Lovely <laughs> performance. All that stuff. Uh, and so they, they had to sort of say hi to about 30 people or so. At the end of the U, the uh, reporters, and we'd all be in our tuxedos, and mm. that, would have to form, uh, uh, extend the line uh, so that and what we did, they, the, the royals didn't actually talk to us, but we were standing there, and the moment the royals left, we would descend on the performers and say, what did the Queen say to you? <laughs> um, and, of course, uh, the big line we wanted was that the Queen, like the rest of us, was uh, hanging on who killed, who shot, he didn't kill him, who shot JR. Yeah. Uh, so we were, this was big, you know, we needed, it was the Queen, like the rest of the nation, gripped by this cliffhanger. Uh, she was, by the way. Uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, so Philip, you know, Duke of Edinburgh, you know, you, know, his, <laughs> you can see him in the performance, you know, checking his watch. <laughs> Uh, and weren't we all? And um, then, uh, so the Queen starts talking to them. Uh, now, now, the Queen, uh, and, and he's he's behind her, as is uh, etiquette, you know. So she, so she wanted to get home. So she zipped around this queue, <laughs> this you of celebrities saying, "Yeah, well done, well done. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. Bye, 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 bye." So she could. So she charged round. 
Uh, Philip, of course, a much more sociable character generally. He, he did like to chat to people. Yeah. Uh, he's locked in conversation with them, but the Queen didn't even look back. She's done. <laughs> yeah. So she gets to the end of the line, and I'm standing right there at the end of the line. And uh, so uh, she looks back, and, of course, Philip is about 15 people back. So he's he's got... He's my, so she looked around and... Ew. <laughs> and uh so she so she sort of stood there and she, you know tiny woman actually, yeah you know uh, this that way if you like uh a tiny woman without her crown uh she, so she just turned around to me and said um and she went did you enjoy the show and i said uh, uh, yes ma'am um uh but i was uh I think uh, it's rather late. It's a long show, isn't it? She said, yes, indeed. <laughs> and then she said, because um, uh, you know when they have the Royal Variety show, the rest of the West End gets the night off. Uh, so uh, she said to me, I'm always rather jealous of the all the actors and performers who get the night off tonight. I said, yeah, no such luck for us, eh? <laughs> she said, no, indeed. And then anyway, <laughs> she carried on talking to me. She said, what do you do? So I said, to her, have you been watching Dallas? Yes, I have. Have you? Ooh. I said, well, yes, of course. I work for The Sun. She went, yeah. <laughs> and so on and so forth. So I'm doing all right. You must have been thinking this is amazing. Well, no, I'm doing all right. Uh, so I did it about, uh, but after about three or four minutes, and by the way, uh, my friend standing next to me from the Daily Mail, Pat Hill, God rest his soul, uh, he he uh, uh, he he, che- he timed it. I talked to her for eight minutes. Eight minutes. So after about three and a half minutes, I I suddenly became consumed. I'm, I'm talking to the Queen. I'm talking to the Queen. <laughs> you know, you're thinking, what am I going to say next? Traffic's bad. Enjoying the weather. <laughs> the weather. Uh, I can barely remember what we said after that. You know, what's your favourite palace then? <laughs> I didn't say that. Um, and, and by about four or five minutes, uh, my mate Pat from the Mail, he's like, he's just bashing me in the leg <laughs> with his feet. He's just kicking me in the leg. And I'm going, oh my god! Oh my. How amazing! And man. then event- so eventually, uh, and I'm going, come on, Phil, come on, come on! I've got to get out of here. <laughs> so Philip finally arrives, and uh, the the Queen said. Um, uh, oh, Philip, just um, this is Kevin O'Sullivan from The Sun, and he went, oh! <laughs> just turned <laughs> and walked out, and then she just turned around and said, "So nice to have met you." I said, yeah, you too. And then Queenie, <laughs> no, no, uh, extraordinary experience, amazing. Tell me about REM, Radio Free Europe. Uh, a very early REM song, bit of a story connected to this. This was when I was romancing uh, my my now wife Henrietta, who you know, well. who's absolutely lovely. Um, well, that's debatable. No, <laughs> that's a joke. Um, uh, what a family unit, you and Chaz yeah, Bo. Yeah. Yeah, he Beautiful did my, house, my dog Chasbo. Yeah, no, no kids. Perfect fi- financial uh, setup. <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, so I was romancing her, and uh, so I was trying to sort of be hip, and. I discovered this brand new brilliant band from America, REM. I'm used to, I'm, I, can't, I can't pretend I'm a, as much into music as I used to be, but I used to be big into it. Mm. I don't have the time these days. Uh, so I was going around saying, hey, you've got to listen to this band, REM. Stands for Rapid Eye Movement, mm-hmm. doesn't it? That's what you, when you're dreaming. Um, and I, so I put this on. I said, oh, yeah, you've got to listen to this. Look, I showed her the album cover. This is their first album. Yeah. Uh, got Don't Go Back to Rockville. It's great, great album, great album. I thought this band are going to be amazing, and that indeed they were. Mm. Um, and uh, so I sh- showed her this album, and she she said, subsequently said she had a moment of great doubt at that point because she thought it was REO Speedwagon. <laughs> So she thought she thought I was going. I love Ario Speedwagon. She goes, oh blimey, is this the right broker or not? Anyway, uh, so this is uh, the name of the album. I think is our is uh, Radio Free U- Europe, and uh, it's a terrific track to this day among the many terrific tracks that Michael Stipe and the gang produced. Yeah, lovely so Almost like a precursor to when they were really, really big, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it remains my favourite REM track. 
Kevin O'Sullivan's with me. We're going to go full on ABC on my 80s playlist. Uh, Martin Fry was where sat where you your sat a couple of weeks ago. Oh yeah, I saw and he him. Did this. Um, he was a great guest. So kind of you know humble, a lovely person. Considering they had a conveyor belt of really good pop moments in the early 80s. What do you think of them? Uh, well, I went to see them at Hammersmith Odeon, as it was then. I think it's called the Apollo now, isn't it? Um, I mean, they they were interesting i think they're from sheffield yeah if i'm not mistaken uh and you know unashamedly pop but great lyrics you know um all, all of my heart what is it uh uh what you walk in the room just, you, you take it stolen my heart and all that sort of thing great great lyrics um with the, with the headlights in the highlights That's of your right. hair yes. and all this kind yeah. of stuff great lyrics i'm big i'm a big student of pop lyrics um and uh, so this is a great song. I think it's much better than what's their other one, the Cupid one. The, oh, with the look of love. Look of love. When Smokey sings, but I, yeah. I agree with you. This one's got that extra. This this one pierces through my emotions. Yeah, it's a great yeah, song. Yeah, well, you, well Adam sub, Adam subtract. But as a matter of fact, now that you've gone, I still want you back. All of my heart. It's great stuff. Lovely. Great stuff. Lovely. Perfect. We're going to that. Um, okay, Soft Cell is uh, Kevin O'Sullivan's next track on my 80s playlist. Um, Mark Almond, what what a, I mean, he was like so many years ahead of himself, wasn't he? Really he was, really ahead of everyone else. Uh, I mean, this was a kind of precursor to electric music, electric dance music. Uh, and again, here's a guy, this is what I always loved. That the, in the 70s, there was too much of uh, British singers, British pop stars trying to be American. Uh, along came Mark Almond, who not only uh, didn't try to be American, he didn't uh, hide what he was, which in those days he was a gay man and yes. proud. Yeah. And uh, good for him. But in those days, it was a very bold uh, position to take. I was going to ask you quick questions about this. So you were a journalist back in these days, and I suppose this was like the pre AIDS thing, but it still wasn't, it wasn't cool to be out or gay. You were different, weren't you? And quite often you were, you know, bad things were written about in the press. I remember, you know, growing up in the late part of the 80s and there was quite quite a homophobic mm. um, tinge to a lot of the, you know, well, the, the no, press. There's no doubt about it. I mean, gay pop stars, uh, yeah, ask George Michael if he was still around. By the way, what a great guy he was. He was just a joy to report on. Was he? Oh, absolutely. Um, li- really nice guy. Um, and we used to talk, I used to taunt him like, come on, George, when are you coming out of the club? <laughs> <laughs> and he'd say things like, it would cost me a fortune. <laughs> but that's what gay stars were told in those days don't tell everyone that you're gay uh and so when uh and i by the way i was in la when george michael was forced out of the closet oh, wow. almost literally did you report on it yeah very much so uh he was caught uh in the closet of a public lavatory in uh, beverly hills if you remember that forced him out of the closet yeah and uh, he did indeed lose all of his sales in middle America. So yeah. It, the, 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 the attitude of the music industry in those days. And that was actually years later, yeah, wasn't that's, it? That's in the 97. 90s. Um, Mark Ullman dates back before then. And by the way, he bravely said, I am that I am. Take it or leave it. Good for him. Uh, but uh, the, the, the position of the record companies, it wasn't homophobic. It was purely economic. Look, if you say you're gay... We'll lose loads of sales, so right. don't, for God's sake, say, say it. And most of them went along with it. Uh, Mark Alman didn't. And again, he didn't sing like an American. He sang very, very English. And the music was incredible and Tainted Love. What a song. Kevin O'Sullivan's with me. Uh, we're talking about journalism, uh, your TV career, your lovely wife. It's all uh, you've picked. The next song on this list, I think, is the greatest intro of any song from the eighties. Aha, the sun always shines. It's just one of those songs that I want to turn up as soon as it starts. I was, I was in. I was, again, this is one of those ones that is, you know, I'm not a massive fan of Aha, but I think uh, that their two signature hits uh, are very uh, evocative of the 1980s. So um, I, I wrestled again, uh, should it be uh, The Sun Always Shines on TV or the precursor to, to that Take On Me? Yeah. And I like, I like that story about Take On Me because it was about like a guy who wanted a girl to take him on as his, her, girl, her boyfriend yeah uh, but they were sweet uh, Scandinavian 
and didn't speak English that well, and they wrote this song, and they got the in the wrong order. It was supposed to, it should be Take Me On. I didn't know that. Uh, so that's why it's called Take, Take On, on me. me. And it's a more tuneful song uh, than uh, The Sun Always Shines on TV. Uh, but I lo- you're right, great intro on The su- Sun Always Shines on TV. And I just love, uh, yeah, as a TV critic, you know, uh, I love that uh, emotion, you know, that the sun indeed does always shine on TV. And by the way, if you look at the videos, you know, Morton Hackett's hair, it's like its like a construction. <laughs> must have taken him about two hours to get it ready. It's so, a like work of art. Yeah, so it? much lacquer, you wouldn't believe it. Never mind the environment, I've got my hair to do. Um, but uh, yeah, a great song, great song and uh, a classic 80s hit. Can I ask you... What's what would you say within the eighties decade? Because you were there, you were reporting on it. What's the biggest story you covered? Nineteen uh, eighties in the nineteen eighties. Oh my god! Uh, well, I, I told you a very early stage of my career. I covered the Brixton riots. Uh, showbiz wise, what was massive in showbiz? God, so many. Oh, I know. I, I probably probably. Uh, it was the advent of EastEnders. Mm. It's a pathetic thing to say. The biggest story I covered was EastEnders. <laughs> but, uh, it was the, huge, though. EastEnders well, was like well, 24 yeah. million, was yeah, there? and they owe, they owe me something. They owe me a drink. I invented EastEnders, trust me. Uh, I mean, this is what happened. Yeah. Right, so in those days, the big, big show, still is, of course, was Coronation Street. So uh, the Sun and all the pop papers uh, had to have a had to cover Coronation Street day in, day out. Don't forget in those days, 20 million per episode. You know, sometimes... It's crazy, more. isn't it? You couldn't uh, even imagine. Huge, absolutely huge. So it was... I was the showbiz news reporter at The Sun. It was meat and drink to me. Uh, anyway, we had a fractious relationship with Corrie. Um, and there was a guy called Norman Frisbee who was uh, famous for... Uh, running their publicity department with a rod of iron and uh, the newspapers had better play the game or he would remove his patronage from you and what happened was the sun we were always sort of running stories that uh, shall we say were not entirely complimentary to the stars of the show but what we needed his help with was interviews so you know you tried to stay on the right side of Norman um in order to get the big interviews. Uh, but of course, we would constantly run stories that would infuriate him. So he uh, was having one of his little temper fits and uh, was displeased with the sun. Mm. So he said, right, you're not getting any interviews. You're not getting any cooperation from us. Now, we would put up with this in the past more and more and more. Anyway, uh, the then editor, uh, Kelvin McKenzie, said to me, he called me and he said, look, I'm sick of it. I'm not putting up with any more of this with Coronation Street. He said, uh, have you seen this new BBC soap that no one's watching? I said, well, what, EastEnders? He goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Why don't we get into that? Well, let's, let's turn that into our big story. Yeah. And it was more um, commensurate with his culture as well because he's very much a southerner. You know, he liked the idea of a soap about London and not Manchester. So... Uh, so I, I made it my mission to get some stories, and I, more by luck than judgment, I managed like on the almost a day after he said, it, I got a ring in, a phone in that Anita Dobson, who played Angie Watts, the landlady of the Queen Vic, and Lofty, uh, the actor, I'll remember his name in a minute, I can't quite, Tom uh, Watts, Tom, Tom Watts, Watts, yeah, uh, uh, were having a, a real life affair, and uh, so I was given an address where she lived. And uh, so I went round with a photographer and I was going to bang on her door and say, hey, Anita, are you having an affair with Tom Watts? And, um, or more to the point, he was saying, Anita, we've got uh, conclusive evidence that you're having an affair with Tom Watts. What do you have to say? We didn't have any evidence at all uh, (laughs) until we got there. I got there with Arthur Edwards. Remember Arthur Arthur Edwards, yeah. The great Arthur Edwards, who's still on the sun. Amazing. These years later, uh, we got there and uh, it was like one of these blocks of flats where you can see the walkway. So I think she lived on like the second floor. We got there, parked the car. (laughs) She came out with Lofty, with Tom Watts. So I I said, get clicking. (laughs) Uh, So we got this story. uh, And so Kelvin bunged it all over the front page. Uh, and the next day I got another ring in and, uh, you know, we started, so 
the more we did these stories, then even better, uh, I found out that D uh, uh, Dirty Den, um, Leslie Grantham, R.I.P., uh, you know, was a real life murderer, done time for murdering. Yeah, someone. before he yeah, was yeah, famous. Yeah, so, uh, so that happened, and uh, uh, so the more we reported on it, the more their viewing figures went up, and so we sort of created uh, this the success of That's East amazing. End. So it was a real slow burner when it started. Yeah, then. yeah, yeah. I mean, but it started to take off, though I say so myself, when I started to report on it uh, obsessively. And the more it became successful, the more the other papers got involved. So they owe me uh, a few drinks, to say the least. And by the way, uh, again, since I'm blowing my own trumpet, <laughs> I invented Dirty Den. Go on. Dirty Den, uh, the, the nickname, Den Watts, the pub landlord, uh, uh, because the, the big... Uh, guessing game was uh, he uh, Michelle uh, was pregnant, so Michelle was pregnant, and yeah. the big thing was who who did it, you know, who who made her pregnant, and so uh, I I got the info uh, the, on the day the the big episode was going out, so I was able to do it for the first editions, while other reporters had to wait till the show went out. I did I banged it out earlier. And uh, for some reason, I can still remember <laughs> what I wrote. It was the answer to telly's most talked about teaser was revealed last night. Dirty Den, the Queen Vic landlord done it. And, and it uh, stuck. So that, that was the first time. So Dirty Den became <laughs> the national name for Dem Watts. Uh, and it was all down to me. Aren't I brilliant? <laughs> So other other journalists have far more impressive things to say <laughs> about their career highlights. <laughs> as far as I was just thinking in the 80s, there were lots of explosive showbiz stories, wasn't there? I mean, like the Rock Hudson thing, Madonna, Sean Penn. There's so much. And I know we've only got, you know, this week to chat and all these songs. But can you tell me something about one of those explosive stories that you must have worked on? Well, funny enough, the Rock Hudson story, uh, you know, the guy was dying of AIDS uh, but uh, his people I wouldn't say that he didn't admit it but his uh, acolytes his the management you know refused to admit it yeah um, but he fell very ill and uh, I just got to the sun then I'd just been employed by uh, the sun uh, to be the showbiz correspondent and uh, covered that story encyclopedically every day I uh, got to know um, one of his managers very well who was really helpful to me and uh, for some reason all we ever did was speak on the phone mm. and uh, every morning I'd phone first thing I'd do would be phone LA and I'd, you know, I'd arrange it with her the day before and say okay, okay if I call you tomorrow she says yeah yeah no problem don't make it later than 11 LA time and all that so and she'd always say oh he's very sick today he's very sick today he's lost you know give me all these details like he's lost and uh, you, do you knew what it was did yeah, you yeah of course we yeah did. Uh, um uh she said he's lost half a stone and i say come on it is age she, she said no 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 we, we we don't know what it is and so on and so forth uh, but of course, then it emerged. So that story was making the front page every single day. I uh, did a lot of coverage of Madonna and Sean Penn, that tempestuous relationship. A colleague of mine, uh, Ian Mark and Smith, over in LA, uh, got uh, the uh, what can I say? The hell kicked out of him uh, by uh, Sean Penn one day <laughs> when Sean Penn erupted because they were standing and uh, basically attacked him and wow. ended up having to give uh, Ian a lot of uh, compensatory money. Uh, so, yeah, I, I covered those. And, and uh, What's you, Madonna like? Can I ask you? You uh, must have known her or met her. Uh, I've, all, I've only, only, again, she's one of the, hi, how are you, nice to meet you people. Uh, there were some people, I, you know, I didn't ask any journalists. You don't get to know these people well, but I, I was quite chuffed once uh, when I was in a bar in Aspen, in Colorado, when Melanie Griffiths came over to me, and I was sitting with these people, and she, she said, that, so they were, it's Melanie Griffiths, and then they go, she's coming over, she's coming over, and she goes, Kevin, how are you? <laughs> yeah, you know, hey. yeah. uh, not now, Melanie, I'm busy. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, you, you, you do get to know some of them who you interview regularly. Uh, I mean, I got to know uh, Sylvester Stallone quite well, Schwarzenegger, uh, all of those 
uh, figures. Uh, Stallone, I once flew to um, Stockholm when he was making the Rocky movies, you know, the big, yeah. uh, big screen hard man. And uh, I, I was on The Sun. I went to Stockholm because he was launching a film and uh, we got an interview. And so, uh, um, so I said to him, I tried my luck at the end of the interview. It got on quite well. By the way, it was. I always remember it, Stockholm. It was about. Uh, uh, it was about like forty degrees. It was like the hottest day they'd ever had. Wow, it was extraordinary. Anyway, um, uh, at the end of the interview, he gave me. He's a great interviewee. So was Schwarzenegger. They knew how to sell a movie. No snobbery. So many movies. I won't talk to the Sun. Why not? We've got four million viewers, uh, rather readers. Yes. You know, we've got a uh, reach of twenty million. That's what Stallone said. He said, uh, "You got the numbers. I do the talking." And uh, anyway, at the end of it, I said to him, "You want to do a picture for?" Us? He says, "Yeah, sure, man. What do you, what do you need?" I said. Got this idea, me beating you at arm wrestling? He goes, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so front page of the sun was me, me beating Rocky, <laughs> stronger than Rocky, uh, which I wasn't, by the way. So, uh, yeah, lots of interesting moments with celebrities, but I can't p- pretend to be uh, close friends with any of them. That rarely happens with journalists. Sure. It does sometimes, but rarely. And, you know, Kevin and I have swapped so many stories over the years. If you ever bump into Kevin O'Sullivan in the street, ask him the story about the showbiz dog. Still love it. It's one of my favourites. Um, yeah, with the showbiz dog? Yeah, the showbiz dog. Who's the showbiz dog? You, Is that the, 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 you don't, which one? The dog that was, was obsessed with the celebrities and it went off. Oh, no, 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 no. That's, no, no, that's, that's my, that's my, no, my dog. Yeah. Stan. Stanley. It was a girl called Stanley. Yeah. We, we got Stanley uh, when there was an earthquake in LA in the middle of the ni- uh, 90s, about 95, something like that. And uh, like, uh, Lots of people got killed, 10,000 people made homeless. And uh, then there was this big appeal. Mm-hmm. By the way, if you've ever been in it, I, I, I've been in a, a, a massive earthquake and it is an experience getting thrown four feet into the air, but off your bed because yeah. it happened about four in the morning. Uh, anyway, after the earthquake, uh, loads of damage, loads of people killed, people living in tent cities all over the city. And uh, there was an appeal went out uh, can you fight, give a dog a home because loads of dogs, something like 10,000 dogs were made homeless, found one. So uh, Henrietta, my wife, said, she said, oh, we've got to fight, give a dog a home. I said, oh, you know, I've got time to have a dog. Anyway, we went down to this sort of uh, pound and there was this little dog, uh, you know, who was impossible to resist. I mean, she was naughty, but she was great. Uh, just a mutt, but a great dog. Um, real character. And uh, she... Um, we, one time, we were walking up a place called Runyon Canyon, f- famous place. Uh, mm. It used to be Errol Flynn's home, but was thrown out into the public. And uh, people t- take their dogs up this year, up to the top. Fantastic view of LA and back down. Always on a weekend, quite crowded. Yeah. Uh, so Stan uh, suddenly ran off, weaved through about sort of 70 people to about 80 yards ahead and ends up with this cu- couple... Uh, way ahead of us uh, and it's just like rolling on the ground and <laughs> <laughs> I love this story and then, and then we we, ca- we finally re- catch up with Stan and who should this couple being <laughs> be that she made a beeline for uh, but uh, Julia Roberts and her then boyfriend Jason <laughs> Patrick I said that's a showbiz dog for you and then we brought her back uh, when we came back at the end of the 90s we brought her back with us at great expense uh, because she had to go through quarantine uh, the air for her airfares were twice as much as ours but we got her back put her in quarantine anyway some years later we took her for a walk to Hampstead Heath and uh, she ran off again <laughs> Died, we, she was prone to running off again weaved through all the weekend strollers uh, about 100 yards ahead oh look she's found some couple uh, to make friends with we'll get, catch up with it who is it uh, Tim Burton and <laughs> Helena Helena Bonham <laughs> Carter <laughs> it's like that dog is from Hollywood. The show this dog. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for your support. I know you've had me on your show, and it's great to have done uh, the opposite and had you here on Virgin Radio. And thank you. Really enjoyed, Kev. I'll see you down the pub soon for a drink. Yeah, you bet. Been a pleasure, Steve. Thanks very much. Yes. Virgin Radio.